Labyrinthine designs, subtle symbology, and incredible effects run throughout Hellraiser. If you pay attention, the movie has such sights to show you. Perhaps one of the most important and memorable relics of the Hellraiser franchise is the enigmatic puzzle box that torments any soul too curious to let sleeping dogs lie. The Cenobites are summoned into the realm of mortals only after an unsuspecting soul completes a puzzle known as the Lament Configuration. You have chosen the Lament Configuration. Of course, the rebooted film on Hulu provides far more clarification on what the Lament Configuration actually means, revealing that there are a variety of solutions and arrangements that yield different results, as well as a small blade concealed in the box to shed the user's blood. But during the film, you might notice several other allusions to the cue beyond the puzzle box itself. The reboot doesn't shy away from offering countless visual cues that recall the Lament Configuration. For starters, the relic is kept in a square safe in an empty container. Within the safe, the box holding the demon summoning artifact is also cubic in shape. Once Riley and Trevor make their way to the Void Estate, the building, while not perfectly square, evokes a puzzle box with its nearly cubic design. The ceiling window of the manor is also a perfect square and is how Voigt and Riley view the emergence of the diamond-shaped god Leviathan as it enters the physical world. The repeated visual allusions to mazes and labyrinths also recall the design of the puzzle box itself. Hellraiser is a franchise rife with humans just as monstrous as the demonic figures that emerge to cause torment. The first film focuses on Frank Cotton, a man twisted up in his own selfish desires. After having an affair with his brother's wife, he is seemingly killed by the Cenobites after solving the puzzle box. Later, a small sampling of his brother's blood brings him back to life, partially. Frank uses his former flame Julia to bring him sacrifices in the form of dates she seduces to help him rejuvenate fully. As you would expect, he eventually betrays Julia. In the second film, Julia is resurrected by Dr. Philip Chenard. She uses him just like Frank used her and betrays Dr. Chenard. Betrayal, it would seem, is a common theme of the franchise. I have such sights to show you. In the sixth film, Hellraiser Hellseeker, Kirsty Cotton returns to the franchise. Now she is married to a man named Trevor, but she soon dies in a car accident. However, the film's big reveal is that Trevor plotted the death of his wife for her inheritance, but in a dark irony, Trevor is the one who actually perished in the car accident. Kirsty offers the Cenobites Trevor in exchange for her own life, and the whole movie is about Trevor living in his own version of Hell. Hulu's Hellraiser features another man by the name of Trevor, this time played by Drew Starkey, who happens to be Riley's newest boyfriend. Longtime fans of the Hellraiser franchise almost certainly picked up on Trevor's name and saw the reveal of his deceit coming. Void hired him to lure Riley and her friends to his mansion so they could be sacrificed for the box. Stylistically, there aren't quite any other creatures in cinema like the Cenobites of Hellraiser. These tormented souls were once human, but have been transformed into monstrosities that represent the epitome of human suffering. Their bodily mutilations represent the worst pain a body can endure, and they often have a connection to whoever the person was in life. The Cenobites of the classic films were often draped in black leather. The Cenobites of the latest Hellraiser received a modern update. Gone are the leather duds of a bygone era. Instead, the Cenobites' designs are even more heavily focused on the horrific modifications made to their bodies. The Hell Priest, for example, retains the sharp needles plunged into every square inch of the demon's head. Below the neck, chunks of flesh are stripped away and peeled back. These sections of absent skin along the Cenobites' chest resemble the tight leather strap design of Doug Bradley's pinhead. If you look closely, you can see how the mutilations carved into the demon's flesh are an homage to the movie Monster's design of old. It's just another way in which Hulu's Hellraiser endeavors to keep the spirit of the franchise alive, even in the subtlest details. The Cenobites don't play around. Whenever the box claims someone's blood, they come to collect. But what happens to the poor souls who die at the hands of these interdimensional beings? The classic series often frame this other dimension as Hell, and the victims of the Cenobites were trapped in a cycle of eternal torture and pain. Hellbound Hellraiser 2 depicted Frank's ghost appearing to Kirsty to tell her he was suffering in Hell. When he appears, she thinks he's the ghost of her late father. His body is entirely skinned, only showing bloody muscle and bone. Later, when Julia is resurrected, she takes on the same form, a skinless monstrosity that glistens in the light against her bloody musculature. It's one of the grislier aspects of the original films. The new film briefly references the idea of skinless souls suffering in the afterlife, but instead of the beings walking around without their skin, the moment is treated as a bit of a scare for Riley. While it's hard to miss this detail, it may have taken a moment for those not well-versed in Hellraiser lore to understand that it's more than a simple scare. Matt appears to Riley inside the Voight Mansion. When she embraces him, she looks in the mirror behind him and sees that she's hugging Matt's bloody, skinless body. The fates of those claimed by the Cenobites are damned indeed. Hellraiser is big on symbolism. Each of the cube's configurations represents different aspects of the eternal rewards the Cenobites have to offer. While the puzzle box was often referred to as the Lament configuration in the previous Hellraiser films, there are several more configurations beyond that initial state. The next configuration is a hexagonal shape. 
When Riley breaks into the Void Estate, she begins rifling through anything she can find that will give her more answers regarding the puzzle box and the fate of her brother. She discovers mysterious drawings of each of the Cenobites she's about to encounter, more fun foreshadowing. She also comes across Void's journal, which details his research of the cube and its secrets. On the front of the book is the same hexagonal shape that is seen when the puzzle box is in its second configuration. Inside the journal, the six configurations are explained. The second configuration is known as the Lore Configuration. This symbolizes knowledge. It's fitting that the book that contains all of Void's discoveries is marked with the symbol of knowledge. It's a fun detail that's easily overlooked. Hulu's Hellraiser isn't a simple rehash of the original movie or its sequels. That's ultimately what makes this latest film a thrill ride for fans and newcomers alike. Despite a differing narrative, the film still draws parallels between its characters and plot threads from the first entries of the franchise. One such similarity is found in Roland Voigt, arguably the main villain of the new film. The Cenobites can also be seen as villains, but they're mostly creatures of habit who only punish the morbidly curious. It often takes a human motivated by greed or the lust for power to enact the horror that comes from the puzzle box. Voigt is a wealthy recluse who's built his mansion in life around the pursuit of the enduring life that the Lament configuration promises. He's become endlessly fascinated with the Lament configuration and has dedicated all of his resources to unlocking its mysteries. I am a penitent. While it may not be immediately clear, Voigt is truly a parallel to another popular Hellraiser character, Dr. Chenard. In the second film, Chenard is a powerful man much like Voigt. He's a prestigious doctor obsessed with the Lament configuration. Chenard acquires the mattress where Julia was tormented and killed by the Cenobites in the first film. After offering a sacrifice, she emerges from the mattress and helps him unlock the secrets of the Lament configuration, which ultimately leads to the Labyrinth in the Cenobite world. She betrays him and he becomes a Cenobite himself. In the final moments of Hulu's Hellraiser, it's revealed that Voigt is also transformed into a Cenobite. Voigt's mansion has unique architecture. Everything Roland Voigt invested in had something to do with the puzzle box and his desire for the rewards that potentially lie within. He had no idea how twisted the Cenobites and their Leviathan god truly were, nor did he realize that no reward of theirs is quite what it seems. The mansion ultimately resembles the labyrinth fans witnessed in Hellbound Hellraiser 2. Kirsty Cotton, as well as Dr. Chenard and Julia, plunge into the world of the Cenobites, which appears to be one massive maze with countless levels and paths. It's a strange scene, but one that ultimately becomes iconic in the Hellraiser franchise as the diamond-shaped god descends from the skies above the labyrinth. In Hulu's Hellraiser reboot, Voigt's mansion has many traps and rooms. But more interestingly, the outside gate that surrounds the entire structure is constructed in a bizarre pattern. The gate is layered with lines, squares, and rectangles. They bring to mind the image of the labyrinth seen from above in the second Hellraiser film. This imagery is made even more apparent when we see the diamond hovering over the mansion at the climax of the film. There's no mistaking that Voigt's mansion is a reflection of the Cenobite world and a brilliant reference to Hellraiser lore. The Cenobites are easily the stars of the new film. While we follow Riley in her quest to put a stop to the horrors of the puzzle box, it's the twisted interdimensional demons that we're here for. Aside from the Hell Priest's iconic head and the Chatterer's gnashing maw, the Cenobites in the new film have gotten a massive redesign. Therefore, we have plenty of new monstrosities to gawk at. What's even more horrifying about the Cenobites is that their mutilations depict flesh that is still alive and moving underneath their creepy exterior. A lot of special effects work and prosthetics went into these designs to ensure they were depicted as gruesomely real as possible. For instance, there is one Cenobite known as the Gasp. She's a Cenobite with the facial piercings and a bowing metal rod across her forehead that stretches out her skin. Even more disturbing is that the skin over her throat is peeled away and spread wide open. When she talks, attentive viewers can see her vocal cords and the muscles around them vibrate. It's simultaneously horrific and awesome. The attention to detail in each of these Cenobite designs is top-notch. The rebooted film is truly a reimagining of the work Clive Barker began all those years ago. It honors the legacy of his creation, but manages to inject more lore into the franchise. But the inspirations for many of the newest film's elements are pretty clear if you're familiar with the film series. Riley takes center stage in this reboot as an unfortunate soul who accidentally mingles with the powers of darkness. Forces beyond her control toss her friends into the meat grinder. Her brother is the first casualty and the one she hopes to save with the power of resurrection. She sees his ghostly visage and realizes he's living in eternal torment. Ultimately, she knows that there's nothing the Cenobites can offer that truly grant her what she wants. Christy Cotton from the original films goes through a similar experience. She evades the Cenobites, but her father is killed in the process. She believes that she sees his spirit telling her that he's suffering in hell, and her goal is to find him and save him. While the story operates a bit differently, there are definite parallels between Riley and Christy's journey. Visually, it's also hard to deny that the brown curly hair shared by both films' heroines evokes a sense of similarity. 
Riley and Kirsty both survived the ordeal, but they have to live with the loss they've endured thanks to the scheming people in their lives who sought to wield otherworldly power at a tragic cost. What's your pleasure, sir? 